Right, Chloe, this is going to be wonderful. I see that we already have some people flying on in to uh, to sure join do. us. Uh, Stephanie has, I don't think Stephanie and or the uh, or or Ken and Shirley have missed virtually anything here. Um, <laughs> Diane, uh, it's great to see you again. Jay, um, uh, you know, Susan and Eric, you guys haven't missed them. It's just kind of amazing how many of the same people keep coming back and how wonderful it is. And for all those people who I didn't mention because there's already um, like uh, 140, 150 people that are, that are in, in there, uh, Frank, Mark, Pamela, um, there's a lot of familiar faces. Bill Fisher, good to see you also. Um, a lot of interesting folks. I already mentioned those guys, Susan and Eric. Got a lot of loyal members, Cyril. Hey, good to have fans. wonderful. We love fans. I just hope that everybody else has got their candy because I've got a big load of candy in front of me <laughs> and we're going to have some fun with these wines kind of trying them against each other and against the candy and all the rest. So yeah. um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's, it's great to have my two sidekicks here and, and uh, this is what this is meant to be. Once again, it's really important to do a few ground rules and the first ground rule is you have already got a glass of wine and uh, that's a good point. Um, I chose to use my funny little thing called a Corvin to open my bottle with, um, and um, and that's so I can enjoy it later or some other time too. But uh, to open all these bottles just for one person seems to be a challenge. Um, but I'm sure for most of our guests, it's not a challenge at all. So cheers. You hear that? Good. Um, the other thing that ground rule is. We love questions. We really like your questions and, and I think it really speaks to all of us. And so if there's a particular question you wanna have, go to a certain person, just let us know, put them in the chat. Uh, we will get to as many as we can. Any that we can't get to verbally and directly here, we will get back to you and follow up with you uh, as, as shortly as we can. Um, there are a number of wines that, uh, that we are having today. And so we will get to all those. Um, but as I said, I'm having a little bit of the, uh, the San Giacomo Chardonnay, uh, from Carneros is what I'm enjoying at the beginning. So, um, the, uh, October club shipment is really what we're talking about. And I believe we're going to send out a little poll right now just to see who's really on. But I, my belief is we've got a pretty high level of folks, um, who are probably wine club members. So oh, yeah. are you a club member? And, um, this is kind of amazing. Oh my goodness. Really high number of club members. This is good. Well, we knew that that was going to be the case. My hope is that you club members basically can share this with some of your friends and get your friends to do these things also. And maybe they become club members if they want to, or they can just mooch off your club membership. And I think that's another way to do it. Um, I find that a lot of my, uh, my friends' kids uh, tend to mooch off their parents' uh, club memberships and they enjoy their parents sellers. I think maybe they want to lock those keys away, maybe fix that um, in the future so that they can't. But um, one of the things that was the goal for this uh, presentation today was to really talk a little bit about harvest and what was our harvest like and, um, and where things went for this harvest and what it, was, what it looked like for harvest. And since harvest is just closed up now and we do, we're just finishing um, all of our harvest, but there's still some fermentations going in the winery. Um, it was a time that we could actually get rye away because um, rye is buried during harvest. And I mean, from mid-August through, well, usually about mid-November, but this year is kind of short and, and rye will speak to some of those things. So rye, can you just talk to us a little bit about what was, what was it like 2020 harvest? And um, we had a bunch of outside influences that made some, gave us some challenges, um, but, um, but how we weathered and things that you guys were doing that might've been a little bit different and maybe some of the things that, that you thought were quite uh, were good. I'd let you know, by the way, you were speaking to over 75% of our people are uh, in, in this group, are club members. So you have a small group, about 25% who are not, um, and it always says not yet. So maybe they'll become, become <laughs> club members. So. Perfect. We've got time. Okay, oh. super. So, so Rye, it's, it's, it's all yours. Uh, talk to us a little bit about where things are. Yeah, yeah. you know, uh, things are winding down. You know, 2020 ended up um, be becoming a, a smaller harvest. Uh, you know, 
dr drought conditions, uh, you, you know, fire conditions, that sort of thing, you know, so we are looking at a much smaller harvest. Um, and, you know, part of the challenge too was power on, power off, you know, PSPS is, uh, you know, fire, no fire, that sort of thing. But I think the one thing that really, really came out as a, as a great highlight for this vintage um, were the people and, and just kind of coming out and, and showing up and getting the work done. I had an incredible team of interns. All our permanent production people are just, you know, steadfast and um, they, Searle was kind enough to kind of keep some people out of the winery so we know we could uh, avoid any, any COVID issues. Uh, and we did, and we're straight on through. And now we're kind of, we're all happily amping down and watching fermentations and stirring white barrels to encourage Jamel and, and letting things kind of come to a, a, a close. And, and that's always a, a, peaceful, a peaceful time here at Chapelet. The pyramid's getting cleaned up and ready uh, so that we can bring guests back and, and get you in with people like Chloe uh, and et cetera, and, and start kind of having you back to our winery. So that, that's more or less kind of what we're dealing with uh, currently right now. You know, I just got off of the phone with a friend of mine who said that he has been on generator power for, uh, for 38 days <laughs> um, straight and he said, you know, when I put this generator in, I was expecting maybe to have a couple days here, a couple days there, but they're over on um, on the lower end of Howl Mountain on that side. So uh, all the poles got burned in that area. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people don't understand, or may many people don't understand that by being on generator power, it means you also have to be getting fuel to the, ge to the generators. And, mm -hmm. you have to and then the other part is you got to shut down the generators a few times just to service them and add oil and do those normal things that you would do when you go to the gas station for your car. Um, and so there are a few other activities that happened that added some challenges for your team. Um, and Ryan, speaking to the remarkable team of interns that you had this year, um, I was really sad to see them leave so early. Usually we get them a little bit longer. Yeah. Usually I get to meet them and spend more time with them. But since we kind of promised that we would all stay distant, we didn't get that opportunity. Um, uh, but from everything that I heard, it, it might have been one of the most remarkable group of people that we've seen come through the winery in any one year. Um, and uh, we, we were pretty fortunate. Now, in the past, you typically get interns from all over the country. Tell us about what the difference was this year. Yeah, typically from all over the world. And then this year, they were all domestic, uh, you know, and, and so that was that was interesting, but it, they all came with their, you know, rich backstories. A lot of these people were out of food service out of New York, um, you know, coming out of restaurants, kind of high end wine consumers or, or sommelier type people. Uh, and they really entered in and wanted to learn about Chapelet winemaking. And, you know, they just really took to it. Uh, just really kind of a, a real good crew this year. Um, but you know, we can, we can pivot and kind of start talking about wines too. You know, let's, uh, okay. let's, get some, let's get some San Giacomo Chardonnay flowing here. Um, well, as we, as we do that, um, uh, one of our good buddies out there, Mark is actually drinking the Calessa Vineyard Chardonnay. And he says, there's really wonderful spice notes. He asked if you could speak a little bit to the Calessa and the San Giacomo when you're talking about the San Giacomo so that um, we can really speak to the difference between these two wines and uh, some of the characteristics. And so uh, we're gonna keep you on the wine side and talk about wine. I'm not gonna take you back to, the, to harvest right now. So <laughs> if you wanna deal with that, that'll be great. Um, yeah, so uh, San Giacomo Chardonnay comes from San Giacomo Vineyards. Uh, they farm around a thousand acres in the lower part of Carnero, south of the town of Sonoma, uh, up against uh, to the mountains that separate the Sonoma Valley and the Petaluma Gap. Uh, and in relation to maybe uh, Lindsay could bring up that map that we've got and we could talk to that. Um, in relation to the San Giacomo's, if you approach the Petaluma Gap, uh, then you'd be in Calessa Vineyards, which straddles the mountain range in between the Petaluma Gap and, um, and Sonoma Valley. So yeah, yeah, there you go. She's pointing them out right there at the lower base of Carneros and then Calessa up, uphill. So the San Giacomo, we really use, uh, you know, target these clones that we've uh, really, really hunting for. You know, Robert Young clone, Hyde. Uh, these are special clones that are 
went to derivatives and they really highlight this big kind of open nose that the San Giacomo has, lots of citrus, kind of high tones. And then it is 100% malolactic and aged in 35% new French oak surly. So that gives it that nice, big, round, rich, mallow, you know, malolactic butter tones in the palate, spices, um, that sort of thing. The Calessa uh, is a little bit different, is it has a little bit different clones. It has some 548, some 809, and it's in the hills and on a slightly different soil series than the kind of more clay loam that we see down at San Giacomo. So they are very different. Um, and, and that's also intentional. You know, we want to paint these things into different profiles to really highlight the strengths of these individual vineyards and what they can do. And so while San Giacomo has this very broad, round, rich, weighty character, the Calessa tends to be a little bit more wound up, a little bit more acid forward and, and kind of more floral in aroma, not so much of that, that malolactic treatment. Absolutely. So right now you uh, you've got the Chardonnay. Uh, oh, this is one of the pairings that we put together with the San Giacomo uh, yeah. Chardonnay. So um, yeah, I mean, in terms of food, Chardonnay is like such just the perfect kind of wine to work with. And Amy Shapley actually came up with this dish. Um, it's some toasted bread with some ricotta cheese and a puree of butternut squash on top very much appropriate for fall, but very much appropriate for Chardonnay. And that richness that Rice spoke to in this wine really complement the, the creaminess of the cheese, um, but also those baking kind of spices that you'll find from the, the butternut squash. And I always love Chardonnay with cheese. I think Comte or any of those kind of harder cheeses like cheddar really complement you know, Chardonnay pretty magically. Um, so definitely good ones to, to start opening your bottles with and enjoying after a night. Perfect. Uh, I think the food pairings are always interesting, and I and it's always nice to hear from some of our guests what things that they're enjoying with with Absolutely. those. If anybody has a comment out there as to what you're enjoying with with your Chardonnay, we're happy to uh, to share that with with other people. But you know, I, I think the, the the limit is almost limitless as to what things you could be having. But I'd say that uh, it, it's wonderful when you find something that really works. Um, so, um, you know, it's interesting this year, I've got tons of butternut squash that came off of our plants. And so this winter, I think we're going to be eating butternut squash. And, and I found that I could keep a butternut squash for six, eight, 10 months if I keep it in a cool, dry spot. Um, and, uh, and so what I use is a corner of my wine cellar, actually, where I have some boxes um, of, uh, of squashes and uh uh, and different types of pumpkins that we will eat during the winter time for making soups and stuff out of. So um, if you have a garden able to do that, that's get another benefit for your, from your wine cellar. Um, well, yeah, let's talk and, a little bit. We have Chloe here who's, you know, gone to culinary school, knows how to whip all this stuff up, and is really kind of an expert in the kitchen. She doesn't <laughs> like to tell people this. Um, no, I mean, I, I, think, I think pumpkin soup, Cyril, that's such a great point. That would be such an amazing pairing with a little bit of creme fraiche on top, just really would, would uh, be excellent with the Chardonnay. Yeah, so, so you club members, if you ever need help out there trying to figure <laughs> out what to cook for dinner, you've got Chloe. Email me. And, you know, I think this is, it's a great resource too. Uh, and I think we have so many wonderfully culinary uh, interested people in, in the winery. And, um, and an interesting thing is you're all creating marvelous foods for your family and for your friends all the time. And I think to be able to share that with some of our guests, it's just so natural for us to do that. I found a, if you can believe it, a pumpkin York candy within this. So we're speaking about pumpkin. This is a pumpkin flavored uh, York candy that is here that I'm gonna have to see what that is in a moment too. So um, when you mentioned that, I saw this, I think, oh, in my little stash, this is kind of fun. So the, um, as we move forward, should we move over to the Frederick Pinot Noir and uh, and do you want to talk a little bit about the clones and the vineyard location, Rye, yeah. uh, of this and then um, and then Chloe, I think we're going to hit you up for some suggestions on some uh, pairings also too. No problem. Yeah, okay. and this is you know the Frederick. Gosh, what a what a special wine. Um, I love making the Frederick every year with Philip and the, and the crew. Uh, so Frederick is Petaluma Gap. 
Uh, and it's on this great kind of southwest little rise. It's like this perfect little bench. So this is one of our first Pinot Noirs to come in the door almost every year because it's, it's just on this little slope and it kind of makes the vines draw down and they're devigorated. The clone is, um, there's two clones uh, and there's Pomard and 115. And they really accent each other very, very well. Um, Pomard is real spicy and 115 has that much more blackberry tone, a little bit fleshier in the palate. And we typically use on our Pinot program a combination of pump overs and punch downs, um, depending upon what we're doing. Uh, punch downs, we have four very small punch down tanks outside, you know, two and a half to three tons fit in those. And then we have our, our larger tanks inside that we do pump over. So we usually do a mix of both pump overs and punch down. Um, for our Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir has to be fermented, it ferments rather quickly. So you want to get in and do a lot of work because it'll drop during fermentation from, you know, 20 ricks down to 10 ricks overnight. And it's really kind of, you got to hurry up and get in there and kind of get those flavors out with that fermentation or it's passed you by. Um, the other thing is this vineyard really just is full of spice and richness and naturally creates this fuller body, you know, weightier Pinot Noir, which is what we really like. That full weight in the palate, kind of full-blooded Pinot is what we're about here. And, you know, it's just such a great vineyard to, to work with. Um, and, and I like that it's somewhat of an anomaly. We all think Petaluma Gap, we think cold, we think harvested later. And here it is, you know, this one is always chomping at the bit and getting in the door kind of before everybody else. Ry, there's a question that's come up and uh, I think it's a, I think it's a very normal and good question. Um, there's a lot more physical activity in a punch down over a pump over. Can you explain what the difference of those two are? Because they both do essentially a similar thing, but one is yeah. done differently than the other. And um, sometimes you have some big, tall, lean interns that are on the top doing one or the other. So uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah, so um, a punch down is really simple to explain, is you fill up an open top fermenter. So you basically have a vat of grapes and the grapes float during fermentation and create a cap. And what you do is you come down and you actually push that cap down in, into solution. You just punch through that cap and really mix up that tank. So you're punching the grape skins down into the, what will be the wine. It's uh, transitioning into wine and fermenting at that point. Rather than a pump over, you take juice from the bottom and you spray it over the cap through an irrigator with a pump. Uh, and it's actually less extractive than a punch down. Punch downs, everybody says they're very gentle. They're actually not gentle at all. You're submersing that cap. You're really putting all of the cap all the way down into the, the, the fermenting juice and then letting it rise back up and create the cap again. So you're really getting in there and doing some heavy work. Um, and it is for... Ours aren't mechanical. We do them by hand. Uh, so yeah, you want to get your, your best back on those and, and really you know, get going. Um, pump overs are, is the majority of what we do. It's what we're set up to do. That's what we use during uh, our Bordeaux. And you know, the rest of our red fermentations are done through pump over. And pump overs can be finely tuned. You know, we can do a five minute pump over. Uh, we can do a 20 minute. And we can just get in and really needle exactly how much more extract we want out of each tank. And this is a daily conversation between Philip and I during, during harvest. So punch downs are good to get a full extract, a very, you know, very physical way of getting, you, you know, that, that wine to become its, its full self. And I'd say that the, the kind of more, you know, razor's edge is, is the pump over because we can do a big pump over or we can ratchet it down. Rather than a punch down, kind of is just a punch down. You're going to get what you're going to get. Uh, you know, if you punch that whole cap down, it's going all the way down and coming up. So they are very different. They're both very useful. So it's definitely a lot more athletic doing the <laughs> punch down. And I noticed that when you want to have somebody kind of do a little bit of a workout, get you know, some aggression, <clears throat> they do that punch down because it's pretty physical doing that. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not... You, you know, the pump over guys get, get, get their fair bit too, though. They're pushing around a Waukesha that weighs about 350 pounds and hooking it up to every other tank and up and down catwalks all day. So 
they, they definitely earn their keep. You know, keep in mind, there's only four punch down tanks. So there's not as many punch downs here at Chapelet and pump over. So do you know who owns the Frederick Vineyards? Also San Giacomo. Um, so again, this speaks to our long-term relationship with the San Giacomo uh, family. Uh, we've been working now with two generations of San Giacomo. Physics, Philip started working with them in 1990, working with Angelo and Buck. And we've transitioned, we work with Mike and Steve, who are the new generation running, running their, their vineyard ops. And they've allowed us to kind of cherry pick our way through their vineyards and find the sites that we really believe in. And Frederick um, has been the one that we've chosen to really kind of put our flag in and, and stand out. We have a new block of, of Frederick coming online as we speak. Um, within the next few years, it should add to this program. That's how committed we are. As we saw them planting this new vineyard right across the street from ours, it's just up the slope a little bit more. So we're moving into that now too. So, you know, it's a constant relationship with them about constantly upgrading our fruit and, and talking with them about how they manage their, their vineyards. So I've got two, two questions for you on the winemaking side. One's from, from Mark uh, asking, are, are you fermenting whole grapes are they destemmed? Are they crushed um, when you're fermenting these and when it goes into that open top fermenter that you're pressing down? And then, um, and then there's another question from uh, Tracy. Uh, when do you start tasting? If you're push pumping it down, pressing it down, doing all that, when do you start tasting to understand where the wine's going? So all red grapes, uh, we bring in, we cluster sort them if we have to. Most of our growers deliver us really clean clusters, so we don't have to do a lot of cluster sorting. They go through our Polonc crusher distemmer, and then they go through an optical sorter. And so what you get delivered to the tank is this pristine kind of caviar of berries. No stems, no off-color berries, no green berries, no jacks, no shoots, no nothing. Just kind of caviar fruit and that's whole berry, no stems in the tank. So we don't do any whole cluster. Uh, and then, you know, we start doing a cold soak that lasts anywhere from three to five days. We use a very slowly fermenting rise yeast. It's called Osmenhausen to get the Pinot fermenting in this slow fashion to allow us to do some work in the upfront phrase. And then we start tasting Pinot somewhere in the high teens of Brixes. The first two days, they really just kind of taste like fruit juice. You don't really know what's going on. But right around 18 bricks, we start tasting every single ferment that we have. We take them in the lab, we spin them down in a centrifuge to get very clean juice so that we're tasting just the wine, not the solids that are in the fermenting vessel. And that really lets us make you know, changes on the daily. So we taste every single wine starting at 18 bricks daily uh, through its entire fermentation. And that really is, that's the best area where we can make change. And Philip, Daniel, uh, Ben and I sit around the table, we taste every single lot. Does this one need a little bit more? Does this need to be pressed? That's how we really structure our whole harvest day. But I really like the Fedric because I think it's just so unique um, amongst our Pinots. You know, the, the nose is always really spicy. And it's just a great wine. Chloe, do you have any anything that you'd want to pair with this? I mean, oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. And our possibilities you know, are endless. Our viewers have been submitting some really great examples. Erica Gibbs said some roasted turkey and vegetables. Um, Julie Bronowski said spicy fish tacos with mango slaw. George Matthews likes to pair it with venison. I mean, all these ideas to me really uh, are sound phenomenal. But you know, Pinot and the holidays which are coming up. You know, Thanksgiving meals and um, just getting together with friends and family and enjoying a big roast turkey and those sweet potatoes or butternut squash, um, those tend to really kind of stand out to me. I was actually thinking with Amy's dish that she had prepared for the San Giacomo, just substituting the squash with roasted mushrooms. Simple with some shallot in a pan, butter, and put that on top of some grilled toast. Sounds absolutely phenomenal with the Fedrick. You know, <clears throat> one of my favorites, we talked about it, during our uh, release of the Pritchard Hill last week. But uh, one of the things that we have up here from time to time during the winter time, if it's a normal winter, is chanterelles. And mm -hmm. rye is also a hunter of mushrooms. And <laughs> um, one of the things that's never been given up is anybody's secret stash. 
when somebody finds a spot where they can get some good mushrooms, it tends to go to the grave with them, or maybe they pass it on when they leave, but that's rarer. Um, Dominic and, and I talk about it and Philip and, and Ryan, all the rest, but everybody has their own ways of preparing these mushrooms. And these mushrooms have such wonderful flavor and they, and they fit so well with the wine. So mm -hmm. I, I'd agree. I think the mushrooms are, are a great, great part of that. And even, you know, we did a presentation on uh, not too long ago, Pinos and pizza. I mean, mm -hmm. it's all about what you put on the pizzas and, and what direction you go. Do you go with a bechamel sauce? Do you go with a, uh, uh, a regular red sauce for it? Or do you even go with uh, something that might be closer to a, uh, a basil uh, olive oil um, sauce of yeah, some type yeah. um, that would work. But, um, but Chloe, as a chef, and it was a <laughs> remarkable creator, um, tonight, once you're finished with the, our little conversation with everybody, what do you think you're going to have with, with this Pinot to uh, enjoy with the Pinot? I mean, I think pizza sounds phenomenal. I always have a pizza in my freezer ready to go, whether I made it ahead of time or get it from the store. I think pizza, you know, souped up with some of your own toppings at home is just one of the best uh, with Pinot. And Frank Wynn actually said the same exact uh, thing on our chat is loves pizza and Pinot. So I completely Frank. agree. I've been spoiled. My wife has just bought me my own. I'm, I've joined the club with Searle and I have a pizza oven at home and, <laughs> you know, get, get the sourdough going and, and make yourself some dough and, and get go. ripping. I also understand that Korean food goes very well with this. I'm getting kind of n nudged a little bit over here oh. about the <laughs> Korean food. Uh, so uh, uh, as, as you can tell, you, you know where that comes from. But uh, I, I just did a presentation with a large group of Asian realtors who were asking me which of our wines go best with Asian food. And I put it back to them to say, look, make me a great meal. I'll bring the wines over and let's figure out what it is, right? Oh, and I'll come along. Perfect yeah, trade. And so um, there was a restaurant in San Francisco called Tommy Toys, which was a remarkable high-end uh, Asian restaurant that had an incredible wine cellar. And so my point is that people enjoy having great wines with great food from every walk of life. And so really it's about having things that, that pair well and match well. So, um, so, um, so Woody always makes comments, you know? <laughs> so I see that Woody is making a comment here too. Woody is a great friend. Woody is great to see you there again. And uh, uh, Woody, you like Pinot with all food. This is good. So, um, so let's let's move on to uh, the 2018 uh, Signature Cabernet, uh, which uh, we have just released in the marketplace, and I think is showing some of its characteristics, and uh, they're really beautiful. And I'll let you both talk about that for a moment while I use my very very cool little gadget, my little Corvin, to open that up because my sidekick does not do very well unless she's drinking some wine. So I think I need to get. <laughs> I mean, I. I can definitely speak to the signature cabernet. I think for us here at Chapley, especially the people who work here at the vineyard, really think of this wine as like kind of the the, the flagship wine for us. It's it's what we think of when we think of Chapley. Um, you know, your dad when he came here 53 years ago, fully intended on on making a, a world class cabernet sauvignon, and the signature cabernet sauvignon was born. Um, so it's definitely a many years kind of culminating to this moment, the 2018 is definitely a very delicious vintage and I'll let Rai you know, speak more to the vintage itself. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to chime in with, with Chloe. This, um, we really have to always give it, give it back to Don uh, for this one. This is our origin wine in so many ways. This is the wine that we've made now for 50 years. So, you know, the signature has a lot of its own identity and 2018 is, just one of those vintages that is just it's achingly good uh it follows 2012 it follows 2016 i'd say you know when i think of 16 i think of 18 almost in the same conversation 18 is a little bit more structured than 16 which i appreciate you know it's got these 
magnificent blackberry tones, um, good structure. But the great thing about 18.2 was just this abundance, too. It was just this long harvest that behaved itself. You know, it started. <laughs> they don't always do that. It, exactly. You know, it started, you know, middle of September and just took us all the way to the very end of October. And hang time in the vineyard was just great. We had this mild weather during October that just let us kind of pick things as they came in. And that's really a gift in a big harvest because sometimes you get years like 2016, which was a pretty big harvest too, but there was a rainstorm right in the middle. And so we had to just rush out and, and get everything in and it all worked out. But it's, those, those days are really long. And, and, you know, my team just cranks, you know, we're doing 14, 16 hour days for two weeks and just going rather than 18 wasn't like that. It was this big kind of gentle harvest and it, it let us go out and pick kind of as we saw fit in this very relaxed way and fill the winery just, just perfectly. I, I would just wish for 18 every year. It's, it's a wonderful vintage. Um, you know, blend is 85% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Petit Bordeaux, and 5% Malbec. Uh, and I think that the, you can see the Petit Bordeaux influencing the Cabernet in there, you know, adding a little bit of that, that blue-black tone. And then the Malbec just to soften out a little bit of that, that hillside uh, texture and give some mid-palate. But really, at 85%, this is about Cabernet. And this is about what our vineyards are doing, all these new lots of Cabernet coming online through the years. And, and what we can do moving forward. So 18 is a very exciting vintage for me. Well, and Ryan, you say it's like this, you know, it's this great vintage that you'd equate to all these really, um, these other vintages that have a lot of like notoriety to them. How long would you suggest cellaring? Julie, Julie Pines asked about it on the chat. Yeah, cellaring is always a great question. Um, you know, I think it's ready now, uh, but obviously it's gonna age. I think this wine definitely is in, in the 20 year pack if you can take it there. Again, Cyril and I have talked a lot about this with people online, and I know that you guys are mostly club members, and you probably have worked out great storage because, you know, you wouldn't be here otherwise. Um, but, you know, not all of us are sitting where Cyril's sitting in this perfectly managed cellar, uh, which is really what it takes to age that long. So I'd say on, on the short term, I really love Sig Cab in the six to 10 year mark, you know, when it starts to really soften you get some bottle age you know the wine really is knit together those tannins become seamless i i really like it in that that six to ten year range which is somewhat achievable you know my cellar is not very big uh but if you have the ability to go longer go longer so you know as we talk about this it made me think of uh a friend of mine brought a bottle of wine out uh to kind of test us a little bit last weekend and and he said, this is a Napa Valley wine, and that's all I'm going to tell you. And he said, you know, how old is it? Where do you think it's from? Da, 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 da. You know, they try all these trick questions with us, right, to, to do. But it turned out that the wine, I mean, I recognize it as an older wine. <clears throat> I recognize it as a well-balanced wine. It's wine that I thought was really quite kind of fascinating, and I really was enjoying the wine. And I think that's the bottom line is do you enjoy it? And it turned out that it was a uh, 74 Heights Martha's Vineyard. Um, and you speak about being able to, and his wife said to us at dinner, she said, how many of those bottles do we still have? And he said, well, I bought three cases of it back in the late 70s, and I still have about seven or eight bottles of it. He said, and I'm so happy that I still have some of those bottles. And I think that that's really what it's about is managing those things. So whether it's Chapelet or Heights or whatever wine it is that you want to have, you just got to, if you think that something's going to be interesting, you have to have enough to be able to push it out there farther out to be able to see what it does in the aging. And, um, uh, and the next question is, uh, and I know both of you do this, how do you tie in decanting to this program, especially on these younger wines? Chloe? I mean, I, if I open a bottle of wine and it tastes delicious, I feel no need to decant it. You know, I think decanting is up to what you feel when you taste the wine, when you first open the bottle. If you feel like maybe it's not as you remember it, or you'd like it's a little tight, or you're not getting a big nose on the wine, it might benefit from, you know, 20, 30, an hour in a decanter. Um, but I would just say, you know, if you 
love the way it tastes when it opens, then there's no real need to do so. So Ryan, one of the questions that's coming up now is when you talk about a wine being well-structured, you know, I, I think it's human beings that are well-structured. Um, <laughs> and, and the first thing that goes to me is somebody who's on a, um, the cover of some magazine, I guess it is, um, maybe Sports Illustrated or something. Uh, I think of well-structured. No. Um, that used to be in the old days, you guys, come on. Um, so what do you think, when you talk about a well-structured wine and a balanced wine, some of those things, talk to us about what you're thinking when you speak about it in those terms. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, structure is what I think of as the complete tannin color complex profile in the palate. So those things all link up to make structure, you know, obviously pH, acid, all of those things influence structure, but really, when I say structure, I'm talking about tannin and the quality of the tannins. So we've all had wines that, um, you know, they're a little bit spiky or drying or raspy in the palate. Uh, and that can be two things. That can be a really high tannin wine, or it can be a, tan a wine that has kind of less color and less body to back it up. So it gives you this almost kind of spiky effect in the palate. Well-structured for me is when everything is in balance. When, especially on a hillside vineyard, you have enough tannin to show the strength of the, of the mountain, of the hillside, of those rocky soils, and give you a representation of full extract, a big weighty palate that's round and rich and kind of wealthy in texture, but doesn't dry you out, doesn't arrest your mouth and leave you wanting a glass of water. That's what I mean by well-structured, is our jobs as winemakers here on Pritchard Hill are to build a wine as large as we can and keep it still graceful and elegant. And to me, that's what well-structured means. Uh, it's the hardest thing to do. Uh, it's what Philip and I struggle with every day. That's our daily sport of blending, is to make something finely structured in, in that way. Well, and Ryan, when you talk about elegance and um, just the grace of Chapelet wines, you know, in terms of food, you would always want that wine to sing, really, when pairing it with something. So for the Signature Cup, um, you know, I would pair it with something very simple, like just a, you know, a seared steak with, basted with lots of butter and maybe some herbs, but just simple and really let the wine shine through with that uh, great piece of meat. Yeah. You know... This, once again, every time you talk about food, it makes me start getting hungry. Uh, the, the view that's behind you, uh, Chloe, somebody asked, is that from Molly's garden? Yes, it's from mom's garden. Uh, it is. And uh, this time of the year, honestly, it doesn't like quite that, uh, that, that verbose, but uh, it still is gorgeous, still a, a great view from there. So yes, that is. And uh, um, I think mom would be delighted to see you using <clears throat> that, that as, as your backdrop. Uh, so one of the other things that we typically would do when people come over is have some cheese or charcuterie or things like that uh, that we might want to put together. Um, when you're thinking of that, is there a particular cheese, Chloe, that you might uh, like to have with any of the three of these wines? And since the wines are so diverse of the wines we've had, we had a Chardonnay, we mm -hmm. have Pinot Noir that's, that's really quite unique. And then a Cabernet is bold and intense, all very different flavors and structures. Talk to us a little about what, what cheeses you might want to pair with, with those. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for the Chardonnay, I think I mentioned when we were speaking on that wine was something like a Comte or a Cheddar, that, um, that sharpness and that kind of saltiness will really go nicely with that, the elegance and that slight, you know, baking spice quality that the Chardonnay will have. Um, for Pinot Noir, I mean, I might do kind of a Manchego or something a little goaty like that. Um, I think that would go really nicely with the Pinot Noir. And the Cabernet Sauvignon, maybe like a washed rind cheese, a little more funk and body to it to match the, the strength of the Cabernet, I think would go pretty nicely. So um, it's not quite winter for us. It's starting <laughs> to get cooler. We've seen some temperatures come off. But one of the things that we've seen in the last few days is gigantic windstorms. And they shut down the power again because of them. This is the last thing that happens typically before it starts to change temperature and that happens every year. 
Um, but I think of uh, stews and these big dishes as things really to have with winter. And Deborah made a hoisin uh, beef stew that she's pairing with our Cabernet. She says it's absolutely marvelous. One advantage of those people who are a couple of hours ahead of us, they're really having dinner while we're talking about what we might have for dinner. Uh, I like the idea of the hoisin flavor within my with within the stew. I think that hoisin flavor gives a lovely structure and, and texture, or or just structure anyway and flavor um, to uh, to a stew. Um, and um, and my wife just did you see what she put in there, Chloe? I did not. Let me see. Okay, she texted it. I, I missed so, it. Uh, a, a truffle tremor is that right? How do you say that cheese? Tremor, I think it is. Tremor? Yeah. Uh, that she likes to have with the Pinot. So um, oh, it's wonderful when the family is all chipping in here <laughs> and watching this from other spots uh, and, and throwing this in. But we should talk about another thing because we're coming right on to a, a, a very humorous holiday and time, especially for those of you who have kids or those of you who are kids at heart, Chloe. Sure. Um, <laughs> and um, so I'm going to put up a simple little uh, uh, poll. But before I put this poll up, uh, I think that it's really important that we enjoy wine on Halloween. And so the question is, do you enjoy wine on Halloween? So let's see what we get from our guests out there. 100% of them. That was quick. My answer is, of course, yeah. <laughs> How else are you going to take your kids out to go trick-or-treating? Exactly. You know, uh, I, have a, I have a great group of friends. Uh, you know, we're not going this year for, for multiple reasons, but usually I, I have a couple of winemaker friends. And the, and the most fun for me on Halloween is what wine is coming out of the backpack. Um, <laughs> And, and that's always a great, a great show. I get a, a few of my friends that have young kids, we get them all dressed up and, and all of a sudden, you know, who knows what's coming out of a winemaker's backpack. It's a, it's a, it's a great tradition. We're missing it this year, but you know, I think, I think San Giacomo Chardonnay and, and a good popcorn ball, or, or, you know, we talked about popcorn earlier on the, on the chat, Chloe, you threw that out yeah. there. That's always a classic for me. Um, what about Pinot, Chloe? You got any uh, Halloween? Yeah, I mean, action? I mean <laughs> the Pinot Noir, I mean, I would definitely say uh, maybe like some kind of chocolate with nuts or um, a Tootsie Roll might be delicious. <laughs> the Reese's, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, definitely, I think, something even like maybe with something a little spicy, like um, there used to be these candied peanuts that had like a red candy coating on top of them. Do you remember what those were called? Can't right recall them, but I think those would be really delicious too. So just kind of a humorous little story when when we were kids right about the same age as your kids um Boston. i think for different purposes but my parents used to do something quite humorous when my grandparents and aunts and uncles were all come over because i think that they were probably drinking wine but what they would do is because they didn't want to go all the way to saint Helena and take us a half an hour away to go someplace so we would have to go from door to door around our whole house and our house is a long, a, a long ranch style house. So as you go from each door to door, a different family member would be inside with whatever candy items. And you never wanted to get there when mom was there because mom would only give out apples. So, so she would always give a piece of fruit. I'm sure your father was good uh, for, the, for the candy give though. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Dad had plenty of yeah. Reese's peanut butter cups and things like that. That's there were, right really the, the candies that, that he enjoyed. But, um, you know, you can be pretty creative with your friends, especially when you're drinking wines and your kids are in a safe proximity to you and, and being able to, uh, to, you know, and I think that everybody this year is gonna have to be a little more creative uh, so that we don't have any issues uh, this year as we're trying to be so protective of our children and, and of our families. Um, so uh, I can tell you one of the great things for me is that all of my candies all came directly to me um, and I didn't have to go anyplace at all. And my little buddy Boomer thinks that this is really, really fun. And he really <laughs> wanted to have to play in this game. But I, I wanna put up a picture. When you get dressed up for Halloween, what you may look like 
uh, if you have a bit of a sense of humor, especially when my staff has a few a bit of a sense of humor. But this is my current sidekick. That's me um, at, at on on uh, last Halloween, uh, and I will show you a picture of the two of us together. So um, I think that's uh, hopefully you get the gist of this. Um, but uh, this is my dear friend Lindsay, who is out helping me right now. Uh, uh, and uh, in, her, in her best Searle uh, impersonation. And when she came out like this, I couldn't stop laughing. But I hope that everybody is going to have a little bit of fun for Halloween and find something else. Yes, she's carrying my little pony with her and I'm wearing my, uh, my very, very formal uh, attire for, uh, for doing weddings and things like that. Um, but uh, uh, it's all meant to be fun and it's all meant to be light. And I, I just hope that everybody is able to take some of that spirit home with them uh, this evening. And uh, and as I say, if wine helps, you should enjoy it. So uh, <laughs> cheers to that. Yeah, and um, and hopefully bringing some of that spirit here to Pritchard Hill soon, uh, right, Chloe? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so I want to just update all of our club members who are on this and people who are not part of our club, just with some of our benefits. Um, so we do get the first release access to all of the new releases for the wines. We send our members six bottles in each shipment, and that um, includes shipping. So now we upgraded everyone's benefits this year and upgraded to uh, complimentary shipping on your club shipments and any other six plus bottle order. Um, and we are hosting on the Hill. So just to give you an idea of what we are um, offering visitors, we are offering a pre-port tasting flight at one of our outdoor venues. Um, for guests up to six per party. Our club members do get uh, complimentary tastings up to six. So you can come enjoy this view um, and drink some wine with some friends and just have a great afternoon. We're also offering a picnic option where you can book um, a table at one of our outdoor venues for 90 minutes, again, up to six guests, choose a couple bottles that you'd like to enjoy at your club discount and uh, enjoy this view. One of the saddest things for Rye, Chloe, and myself, and Lindsay here is that we are seeing a very small portion of our really good friends in our extended family and all of you in the club. And we appreciate you staying safe for your families and for for the country doing the, doing the right thing, wearing your masks, all those things. Um, and so we understand, but for those people who who are coming and are available to get here um, and are more, more local. Uh, we want to be here for you and we will do everything we can do to, to get you in. Um, it's, it's a bit challenging because we don't have as many venues as we used to have, uh, but we have other venues and I think those other venues will work and one way or another, we will, we will get you in. And so the, the other thing that I want to ask for is if you have ideas for other webinars, I'd love to get your input. All of you are club members. Many of you have been club members for 10 and 12 years or more. I looked at the list before I got on. We have a remarkable group of really supportive people who were out there. And if you have ideas or something you'd like us to talk about, um, I can guarantee you that uh, Rye, Chloe, and myself, and Lindsay helping us all the way through will be happy to try to put together a, a webinar specifically on that, to that topic. And if you would like to have a webinar done for your own family, for an event, for, um, for whatever it might be, some special uh, program for your friends, uh, let us know. And if we can uh, put together something for you, we've done a number of these. They're great fun for us. We enjoy doing them, uh, but, but we're really happy to, to do special events really tailored just to your group and just to, to who you are. So um, if we can do that for you, just reach out to your ambassador, reach out to any of us, we'll be happy to uh, pull that together for you. And uh, yeah, Cyril, thank you for reminding me, actually, we are offering the virtual tasting option as well. So if you'd like to coordinate, um, you know, a few wines that you and some family members would like to enjoy together via Zoom, we can ship out all those wines to the individual groups and uh, facilitate a, a virtual tasting for just your private party. And we can do this for five people or 50 people. It doesn't really make a difference <laughs> when we get it out there further. So we're happy to do this kind of for, for any level, level 
We've done a number of birthdays, some anniversaries. We've done a number of different things that have been really fun for us because we get to engage with you at your party and just be uh, basically be able to, uh, to to add some humor, hopefully, to to it and to to have some fun. So, um, so um, this this has been great fun, and I think that uh, there will be some remarkable wines from the 2020 vintage. There is no question in my mind that if regardless of any of the issues and challenges that we've all had over the last few couple months, um, there's going to be some stunning wines. You may have to look a little harder than you did in the past. And I will, as I've said at every one of these, because people keep asking, my guarantee to all of you out there is that we will not put anything in the bottle that we are not completely proud of and believe that it speaks to our very best of what Chapelet can do, not just in this year, but if it doesn't meet the caliber and quality of wines we've made in the past, we're not gonna be making, making that wine. We will sell it off in bulk to somebody else. We'll do whatever we have to do, but um, the only thing that'll have Chapelet name on it is something that is remarkable. And you all know there's kind of a money back guarantee. If you don't like it, you let me know. We'll replace it with something else. We'll do whatever we need to do, but um, this is, Life is short. We love doing what we do. We've got an incredible team uh, here and we're de really dedicated to, uh, to doing what we need to do to, to make things happen. Yeah, and just a reminder for any of the club members here, if you'd like to acquire more of the wines that we tasted through today, as well as any of the other wines we released in this shipment, you do get a reorder pricing of 20% off the retail price. So. Um, if you'd like to, it's available for the next uh, three weeks or so for you to reorder those wines. And we would be happy to send a case home to you and make sure you've always got Chapley wine at, uh, at your disposal. And so then keep coming on Thursday. You know, we've got more and more of these webinars. Uh, as Cyril said, bring us some topics. We'd love to, you know, spin up some that you want us to serve. Uh, we keep kind of making up these things as we go and, and more and more topics keep coming up. So. I know we've got some coming down the pipeline that are really fun. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I think Philip and I are gonna talk all things barrels. So those people out there that are just Cooper geeks, uh, bring it on, uh, bring questions, we're ready to go. Uh, so you should see either me or Philip uh, at that. And then there's a whole bunch of others. You've got chocolate pairing, et cetera. It's a whole calendar. So keep coming on Thursdays, bring your friends, bring your family, spread the word. So. Ryan, one of the other wines that we send out, I believe, Chloe, and um, but I'm pretty sure we send out the cultivation. We did. Uh, this, and some people don't really understand what maybe what cultivation is, but I, uh, it's one of my favorite kind of fun wines uh, that, that that we have. W would you, Ryan, like to talk a little bit about that because that's a wine that I I know is near and dear to your heart too. Absolutely, uh, cultivation. Um, predominantly comes from Ball Mountain Vineyard. Uh, Ball Mountain is where we also get our Zinfandel. Uh, it's the only site we have on the western ridge of Napa Valley. Uh, all our other vineyards that we work with are our own and then on the eastern ridge of Napa Valley. That's, that's where the Bordeaux's come from. However, we work with this place called Ball Mountain at the top of Wall Road and it's a really special place. It's dry farmed. It's got really old Pinot Noir and by really old I mean about 50 years or so. Um, and then it has Petite Syrah, Malbec, and a little piece of Syrah. And so cultivation birthed out of like trying to find something, you know, not Mountain Cuvée for the club. And we thought we could make what we kind of, you know, I really see it as kind of like a heritage blend of California. You know, Zinfandel and Petite Syrah are two very special varieties for California. And they're up there on Ball Mountain getting dry farmed. Uh, so we thought, okay, Zin, Petit Syrah, and then sometimes you'll see some Petit Bordeaux or Malbec, but usually just Malbec. So it's Zin, uh, Petit Syrah, and Malbec, and those mostly come from Ball Mountain. And it's a fun blend. It's just meant to be this, you know, big batch of berries and spice and all of these wonderful things that Petit Syrah and Zin have that are so different uh, than the Bordeaux varieties. Um, the Malbec kind of gets in there as a, as a buy-in because it's right there, but it, it lends this kind of red berry to the whole mix. And, and it's just, it's a fun blend to make because it, it varies so much year to year. You know, we, we kind of can swing the blend wildly to really appropriate it to the vintage. 
So if Zinfandel is just having a stellar year, maybe there's a little more Zin, or maybe there's some more Petite Syrah that year to give it a little bit more structure, or, or the Malbec really is kicking. So we'll, we'll put some more Malbec in it. So it's a very dynamic blend process. And, and it's a really fun blend for me because I do think these heritage grapes of California should stay around. Uh, you know, more and more people are transitioning to Bordeaux only. And it's really a, a nice thing that Chapelet lets us go over there and, and grab these grapes that are super special to us. Well, it's interesting to watch the chats and the comments that are coming in. Uh, Julie, Julie is such a wonderful supporter. She said, everything goes great with the cultivation. Uh, and uh, Not and, far off, not far off. Well, and I think there's people uh, who are actually enjoying the cultivation with their chocolate and Halloween treats and candy. But I like the last one, which is uh, it really pairs well with lamb and burgers and lamb burgers. So I, I would agree. I think the cultivation is a pretty multifaceted wine. It is a wine that is really quite lovely. And it's, it's nice to do some things, as I, I agree with you, Rye, that are just because you have something remarkable to work with. Yes. And I think that's really a lot of fun to do. So, so this has been great fun. Go ahead, Rye. It's, it's, a, it's a vineyard that's really special. And I think that that's whenever we contract with a vineyard, that's what we're focused on. We're focused on not only the site, but the people involved. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Joe Votek's been farming this place for a long time. You know, he's training these other two young guys to, to do it now. It's really specialized, you know, and, and it's just such a cool place. So we like to access places and and the people that manage those places because those two things are what make great vineyard it's not it's not just the dirt right it's the it's the culture it's the people it's the work that go into it and, and that's what we really value and that's that's kind of what's special about how we source here absolutely it's their story yes well i we did think of some candy pairings for the cultivation as well and one oh, that i'm wow. pretty excited about was you know, being from the Bay Area up here, uh, Ghirardelli chocolate squares with like the raspberry jelly on the inside. I think that would be pretty nice with the cultivation. There you go. <laughs> Big gummy. There you go. Those are lifesaver gummy and mounds. Okay. I like it. Coconut. Part. That'd be pretty tasty. So, well, I hope everybody has a very safe, wonderful. Halloween. And for those of you who figured out how to get out and do that, do it safely. Um, watch out for your kids and cars and all those things. But um, the most important thing is to be safe right now and, um, and what the heck, enjoy, enjoy some nice wine uh, with the burgers and with the other things. And if the kids bring back too much candy and you're still having wine, I guess you get to try that with the, the candy with the, with the uh, wines also. If but, any of you dress up as Searle, send us your picture. There you go. <laughs> oh my goodness, this yeah. could be very dangerous. Uh, uh, yeah, you might get a you might get an award of some type, uh, especially from Lindsay because she put so much work and effort into becoming me, uh, and I just couldn't <laughs> believe the likeness that she was able to pull together to make that happen. So, uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Have a lovely, lovely evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Uh, Cheers. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. By the way, yes, she is the one who making it all happen there. So <laughs> she has been standing here, sitting here the whole time making it all happen. Mm -hmm. So do you, you realize how technically inept I would be if, if I didn't have some help? So thank you all very much. Cheers. Look forward to seeing you all as soon Cheers. as we can. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.